morning. Not that I've ever been accused of it, but can everybody hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> Welcome friends and family, church family, guests, our friends and family that are on Facebook watching us this morning. Welcome to an absolutely glorious Sunday morning here at Village Point. A Village Point without masks. So it's so glad. <laughs> We're so glad you can join us here today and just welcome home to the house of our Lord. Can you all join me in prayer this morning? Gracious and loving God, we come to your house this morning to fellowship with you, to learn the lessons that you would have us learn. Be with us this day as we seek to become more faithful disciples of you to help fulfill your mission here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now let's all join our voices in song as we sing our first hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. announcements this morning, I call your attention to the back of the bulletin. A reminder that our men's prayer group will be meeting on Wednesday at 8 a.m. at Castaway Grill. If you've never had a chance to be a part of that group, it's a great, it's a really great tight group of uh, fellowship. Uh, Jeff leads that on Wednesday mornings. And <laughs> the other Jeff, <laughs> Jeff and Jeff, <laughs> lead that group in the morning. And I, I, I Highly, you know, encourage y'all to take advantage of that. The ladies' prayer group will be meeting Thursday at 8 a.m. at tea time in Shalot. Uh, once again, the, I don't know if you heard me with the airplane there. Uh, it's 8 a.m. Thursday. The ladies' prayer group will meet, and the Patty Jones Circle will also meet at 11:30. All are welcome. Uh, make sure they bring in a lunch. I believe. Make sure you bring a lunch with you. Also, our flowers today are given by Jeff and Terry Patterson in memory of Jeff's brother, Brian. So thank you very much for the beautiful flowers this morning. And now, to start our joys and concerns this morning, uh, I'd like to call Brother Richard up. and He has a very special joy he'd like to share with us. We equip and empower our people to, to do the work of God, and you continue to do that. Gabriel and John, if y'all will, and come up here and be with the priest. Find the ground. Find the ground. <laughs> Find right down by the flowers. I was. No, that's not it. It's what's the one from my, I don't know. Mike. My flowers. Well, I bet that's <laughs> it. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Uh, Y'all face them if you will. Deb, you stay on this side right here. Um, and so Debbie has never been baptized. And so through the ritual, we see how we receive and profess faith in Jesus Christ. So first I ask you on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, rejo or reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. Um, I, I, I celebrate that. And so, and John comes to us as a baptized believer on a profession of faith. So, first, need to get out of y'all's way. Uh, Debbie, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I look at both of you now and I say, now this is Village Point United Methodist Church. This is where we kind of bring our baptism, our service, and our worship together. These people who are here, some are visiting, but I think most of them are baptized believers. And so you are not baptized unto yourself. We baptize you into the body of Jesus Christ, and that's us. And so that's what I did with you, Debbie. John has already received. So I ask y'all, will y'all be faithful in, in your worship, in your giving, in your service, in the name of Jesus at Village Point? If so, say we will. That's what it takes. All right. God bless you. And I'm so glad that I first got to marry y'all. Now I get to take you into the church. All right. All right. The other joy is that they are most definitely, you know, very happy newlyweds. <laughs> so, yeah, just like, you know, we were talking this morning. You know, he agrees with me. She's not our, you know, with my wife and his wife, they're not our better half, they're our best half. <laughs> now, we have a number, a couple of joys this morning. First, I believe we do have a kindergarten graduate in our midst today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of you have Facebook, but if you have heard her do the prayer on Facebook, wow. it is absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. We are very proud of you. And we also have an, uh, another very happy celebration day. I've been told that Ms. Holly Scholar is retiring from Four County Electric after 40 years this Friday. Yeah. <laughs> 30, 30 years? Thir well, th I'm sorry, 30 years. Well, it's hard to believe because she's only a day over 29. <laughs> 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 I've been told to definitely celebrate this beautiful weather and the ceasefire in Israel. They make sure we you know, celebrate that and you know, hopefully peace is coming in our lifetime. Also, I'd like to, uh, on a personal note, my kids finished up with exams this week. I know a lot of kids in the count this county and Columbus County are taking their exams this week and next. So I'd like to say a special prayer for our graduates this week. I mean, we're sending them out into an uncertain world during an uncertain time. So let's make sure we keep our graduates in our prayers this week. Okay. Let's see if we got any other joys this morning. And I believe it's time. Have we got any other joys for the community of faith this morning? If not, we'll move on to our concerns. Uh, Alan Farr, unfortunately, has colon cancer. We need to keep him in our prayers. Uh, Vivian Scholar has surgery coming up for cancer, and Bofar has esophageal cancer. I've been asked to mention those names specifically today. Uh, keep that family in prayer. They're related to Miss Sherla. Uh, Hunter 
Uh, Mr. Gene's going to Maryland this week to have some tests done, so we definitely need to keep him in prayers for his test and some traveling mercies. Mr. Allen's still in the hospital. We need to keep him in prayer. Uh, just keep good thoughts and keep Miss E.B. in your prayers as well. Uh, Miss Becky is still recuperating. Uh, let's see, Rebecca and the family. That's Marty's daughter. We need to keep them in prayer. Uh, Dylan, Charles, Betty, Larry, Scott, and are, other, are there others for the community of faith this morning? If not, let us go to our Lord and Savior in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly God, we come to you this day with petitions on our heart for those who we care and love. Please be, the, be with those this day who need your healing touch, your caring touch, who just need your ear to know that wherever they walk, you walk alongside. Be with all of us this day as we strive to just become more like you would have us be, to do the things that are right in this world, to take care of those who don't have enough food to eat or a place to sleep at night. Please be with a troubled world as we try to make it better each and every day. Amen. Please join us now for our second hymn, and that is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. want to share a little something as we move towards uh, the, the preaching part of worship for today, and that is that we're, uh, we're continuing to improve, and, and I like that. I was, I was telling Terry a while ago, I'm up to about 17 pounds since I fell out of love with cake and pie, and, um, and, and it's made a difference, and then I was talking to Jean uh, one day, Jean Shira. Uh, she'd be over here, I reckon, and, and um, we, we, we are replacing the pews and the carpet inside the church. We have realized that we have beautiful hardwood floors that have been bleached by the sun over the years. And so I think when, if we can work this out, and Jean's trying to work it out, she's a trustee. She and Jamie were talking about all of this. Jamie chairs it. That, uh, we, while we got the pews out of there and the carpet out of there, we need to refinish the floors also. So, so what I like about that is we are improving 
our place of worship indoors. And don't give up. We are going back. I don't have a date for you. Uh, but we, we're working that way. And ultimately, we have a, a at-home piano. We're going to get a new piano as well that is really for a church. And uh, Sarah will be amen in that whenever she sits down at those 88. So we, we're looking forward to these things. And, and I think it's significant to say to you that improvement implies change. And I think that we all should be thinking about how can we improve our spirits to be drawn closer to Christ and be more active and more giving and more focused on the church. When I say giving, uh, I'm not talking about money. M money's always relative. Now, we need it, but I I'm talking about giving more of yourself over to Jesus. And th these things are, are, are always on the front of my mind. Um, uh, the only thing about this little lectern up here, it don't have any side tables to it, and I always struggle would not have enough space. Now, who bought this great big flower that put up here? Uh, Terry Patterson. Well, I love Terry Patterson, so I, I can't say a whole lot about that, can I? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to read my text in a few minutes from, from Scripture, but I want to get started. I, I've shared with y'all a number of times that I came out of the lay witness renewal years of the 70s, 45, 46 years ago. I was a part of a lay witness renewal experience. I accepted Christ, and I became a part of those. About 20, give or take, years ago, as the church was looking at the church, seeing who was among us, who we were not reaching, some, some of our leadership began to talk about how we might bring people outside of the church into the church and what they might be looking for. And as they did their search and they did their, 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 their work that was involved in all of this, they came up with a, a catch word around all of this, and we call them seekers. Many churches have, have seeker Sunday school classes, and a lot of us have added, I mean, thousands of services have been added to churches, and some churches are all about contemporary worship and, 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 or, or seeker services. And, and, and I want you to think around some of that and think about the ways that we, uh, we have tried to go out and, and, and see how all of this could come together. And, and I want to say to you, it's, it's more about culture than theology. Theology doesn't change, and preaching will not change. But how we reach the lost, how we bring people to Christ, is different. And some people, now my, my daughter and her family go to two churches. They go to Skyland United Methodist Church, and they go to a mega church very close to their home in Arden. And, and I go to both with them. Most of the time when we go, we go to the mega church. It's huge. They have other campus. They have a preacher about 10 years younger than I am. That makes him still old. And um, he gets up there, and he would wear blue jeans and a polo shirt. All right? Today's Pentecost, y'all. That's the red tie. Don't get used to it. I'm not doing that every week. But it's Pentecost, and I'll talk more about Pentecost in a moment. But they, they have people that kind of come as you are. And the contemporary seekers often want different music. Now, I can tell you now, Sarah and, and I can easily adapt. If we had people to come into our church that they come dragging instruments in here, all right? We could have guitars, couldn't we? We, we could have brass. We, could have, we, we got a keyboard right here. And we got one who really knows how to play that. So we, we know how to do this. And that's what the seekers wanted. And if they didn't want to come at 11 o'clock, they started a 10 o'clock service. My contemporary service that had between 350 and 400 out of the three services, it was the middle one. It was larger than the con contemplative service at 815 or the, the about 11 o'clock uh, uh, traditional service with the robes and the choir and the bit. By far, and many gray heads were in there. They had, we had so many instruments that had to take turns at Fuquay. We had so many people wanting to lead the singing 
they had to take turns getting up lead, leading the singing. Seekers, contemporary worship was very strong in that church. It was the largest and greatest church that I ever had an opportunity to serve until I got here. And we, of course, surpassed them, not in number, but we have in so many ways, we, 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 we're a great church. But those people came at odd hours, and, and they came uh, in, in shorts and polo shirts, barefooted or in flip-flops. They, they came, and they wanted to find the legitimate church. They no longer wanted to hear an organ playing. They no longer wanted certain songs that they knew of their grandparents and parents, the ones that we largely sing here and still love. But we can adapt to all of those things. They, they, they made these adjustments. And we have some mega church out, churches out of the contemporary experience. Matter of fact, our largest church is, is right outside of Greenville. They, the last time I got a number on them, and, and, and the guy that's the pastor there has been for many years, he didn't build it to be a big church, but he's maintained it. His parents were in my church at Fuquay. He was out of Fuquay. And, 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 and it's called Covenant. And it's right outside of Greenville, North Carolina, 2,000 people. They don't have anything but contemporary worship. And they have college kids and they have uh, older uh, kids like us. They had all people there who were seeking God in this more contemporary way, which, you know, attendance was very important and, and they were there. Contemporary services, I think, are, great, are really great. But I don't think they're the key to reversing the trend of the decline of church uh, joining and, and participation that's been going on for many, many years now. I think that the, the church in attendance can be found exclusively uh, best done in the design of and the way that we worship. We have to rethink and re-examine every aspect of the ways that we do ministry. Uh, we, we take a step beyond the seeker sensitive and we look at an even newer way of doing church. And I think here's the catch. It's not really new. It's a ministry style, a ministry strategy that dates back to the very beginning of the church. Today, I want to talk to you about the church, the ways that God in, in, intended for the church to be from the very beginning. And, he, and I want to begin by asking you a question. Uh, the question is not, what kind of church are the unchurched looking for? That's not, that's not it at all. You might think so as you see the, the ways that they dress and the times that they want to come and the kinds of music they have. What the unchurched are looking for, rather, I think, or what kind of church is God looking for? And that is the one that we are about. The Bible makes it clear God wants us to be sensitive to the needs of the unchurched and the lost, but the Great Commission will never change. What we do in this place has got to draw people like Debbie that want to get up, make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ at the tender young age of 39, and, 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 and then join the church and make a pledge and a commitment to be a part of who God is. Our call to evangelism will not be re revoked until we're in heaven. We've got to make disciples that make disciples. Something is more expected from us as the church of Jesus. What does God want us to be? I, I ask that question every day. If Jesus uh, visited our church, it, I, I, I kind of envision this. You know, that, that I look out here and there's somebody here that I don't know. There's a man here by himself that I've never met. And he comes and he worships, and next week he comes back. And the next week he comes back, and finally I have the opportunity to interact with him, and I go over and I shake his hand. I say, I'm Richard Stone. I'm the pastor here. I don't believe I've met you. I'm sorry I don't know your name. And he looked at me. He said, my name is Jesus, and I've been coming here. And this is the kind of church that I've been looking for. I visited the large and the small. I visited the denominational and the undenominational. And I, I've been looking for, for the true church, and I found it at Village Point. What a dream I had this week. 
as I was pondering that. Today I want us to look at a passage of Scripture from, from Acts 2. It's about the day that the church was born, okay? We call it Pentecost. Today's Pentecost, it's red. That's why the front door of the church is red. It may not be the prettiest color to you, but it's red, and it's been red. It'll probably be red going forward because we aren't about aesthetics. We're about church and history and faith. We're about who God is among us, and Pentecost was very important. Well, the followers of Jesus were told by Jesus, y'all go to this place, y'all go, go to this upper room, I'm going to call it. Y'all stay there. Just stay there. I'll be there directly, good southern term. I'll be there. Just, just, just sit there and wait on me. While they're there, the, the, there's something like a flame of fire goes into that room and it lights on those disciples and they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin speaking in other languages. People in the streets who, who traveled to Jerusalem said, I can't believe this. He said, I, I, I know a lot of these people. They aren't educated people. They don't know all, they don't know French and Spanish and Portuguese and English and on and on. I know they don't know, but I hear them and they're speaking in my language. They, they're speaking my language. Do you understand, Richard, this morning? Am I speaking your language? Can you hear me? Huh? Yeah, because I want you to hear that still small voice as it dances out here among us that we be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, I've been drunk. I don't know about y'all. Uh, I don't practice that. But uh, they, they, that, that's how people are who are outside the church. Well, they just drunk. And, 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 and all the things that went on in Scripture around that. And it had nothing to do with it. Peter even said, oh, it's early in the morning. They're not drunk. They had not been drinking. And then he begins to quote from the prophet uh, from Joel. And he quotes to them, and, and what I will read to you, starting with verse 17. Now, this is an Old Testament quote from Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood, fire, and smoky mist, the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's our text for today. Well, what Peter is doing, and what I just read you, quoting from the prophet. He is standing up before the people. He's already told them they're not drunk. Yes, you heard the word from the disciples in your own language. Let me tell you about Jesus. And he begins to preach. And he looks in, into their faces and he says to them, How many of you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and be baptized this day. And it looked like a Billy Graham crusade where the stadium was filled and 3,000 souls or people came forward and they were baptized and the church was born. That was the day of Pentecost. It was a festival for some who don't know any better than to be cutting their grass on Sunday morning when they could be here because they haven't felt that spirit and that power among them. And I'm saddened for that. The saddest thing about it is, as I look at me, I think some of those people are better people than I am, and I'm here, and they're cutting grass. The church was established. We learn here he wants to, what, the church, he, what he wants the church to be. When, he asks what, uh, when we ask what God is looking for in a church, we read those words. And I think that the, what God wants in a church is he wants a church that is immersed, that is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the presence of God's Spirit 
working among us. That's what he wants. It's as simple as this. Some churches have it and some churches don't. Ours, by granny, we're going to have it, and we do have it. I want to make sure that we do everything we can to ensure that we have a church that is filled with the Holy Spirit. That on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up. In the, in the last days, he said, God said, I will pour out my spirit. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will cause wonders in the heavens. We want to move among God's people. God wants to do great things even through us and perform wonders and miracles. And I like those kinds of thoughts. We do think that, uh, that, that the church that's fully immersed, that we will experience authentic worship together. You know, I have a daily thing. I, do. I preach it to y'all all the time. But I know the things that happened. Gene had a tragedy that happened yesterday. We were laughing and, and, and playing golf. And, uh, and I'm going to have to work with him and Jay. Who else was there? And Richard and John. Yeah, you ought to hang your head down. None of them can putt a golf ball. None of them. I'm letting y'all up for air right now. I'm going hard today. I know that. Huh? None of us could putt a golf ball. It was pathetic. But we had a great time. We had a great time. Gene went home and his dog died at 630. There ain't never a good day for your dog to die. There wasn't a good day when Abraham had to be put to sleep. It's a sad thing. Gene was with his church buddies yesterday, and we were doing some good, fun things together. You don't know what each day is going to bring. Whenever, uh, where are my babies? Are y'all listening? I can't hardly see y'all. All right. Whenever they came by this morning, I got to see all my lovely girls. I said, Carmen is just in all right is what I was really asking. He didn't drive too good last night according to what she said, but he's all right. That's all I cared about. He's all right. I, 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 I want to make sure that my people are all right, and I was texting Gene and letting him and Becky know how much I loved them last night whenever he shared that with me because it was a very, very sad moment for me. I get up in the morning and I read my Bible and I read one or two, because there's two there, there's, uh, devotion books. And sometimes, even either in, in, in my devotion time or throughout the day, I'll be singing. You know, I'll be singing a hymn as an extension of, of that. And I'll be praying and then Diane and I will be praying. It's important for us. I don't want Carmen to call me and tell me about a wreck or any such as that. And, and I'm sad whenever we get bad news or something happens uh, that, that challenges our lives. It, it's important that I, I do those things, those devotions in the morning. But I'm going to tell you what, it does not compare to being here, to hearing Sarah play those hymns, to hearing all of you sing those hymns. And I get to be a part of it. And I soon realize that worship, it, you know, singing is important, but it ain't about singing. Preaching and scripture are important, but it's not about that. What it's about is, it's about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we come together, and I get to see your beautiful faces, and I get to fellowship with you, and I get to bump fists and elbows, and I get to try to borrow Mark's hat. Um, it is just amazing. At, at how important it is to me to be in this place. And, 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 and it's, it's important. It's more than me being by myself. I draw strength and courage from being in this place. Another characteristic of a spirit-filled church is that we will experience changed lives among us. And, and I connect new pews, new piano, new carpet, new reshined, refinished floors. I connect that to newness and ongoing change, which is the result of what we have been doing now, at least since I've been here. 
because when we get through doing that, each one of those, we'll be able to pay for it. We, we, we have sacrificed, we have given to the point that we can make changes here. And that's what it's all about. We, we, given, we want to give ourselves to a point that God can make changes. Terry and I sitting down here, Terry and I grew up in the same church, graduated from high school, same year, she and I and Diane, and, and we're sitting down here a while ago on a diet. Well, John and I are doing this. Well, I'm doing that. I said, my daughter's doing this, and she counts the points and weighs in. And, you know, we're trying to make changes. It's never too late to make a change. And it's a little bit of long, and just like you gave a, a little bit of long, and you give of yourself to Christ a little bit of long until you can, you can look back at where you were, and you can look forward and say, oh, look where you are now. I said, wow. I would have never thought. I would have never thought I would be willing to serve the Lord on this level. We put inspired worship together. We come together in fellowship so that the Holy Spirit can move among us because only God can change lives. But I'm going to tell you something. Your witness, I forgot to tell y'all, you need to bring your witness too. They added that to the ritual. It's not in the book I had. Uh, your, your place in worship, your witness in the church and in the community, the things that we do in the name of Jesus are the things that God uses because God wants to change lives and it is our witness that God uses. God changes lives in a way that preaching and singing and all those things don't completely do. We don't change lives near the way that God does it. Uh, you know what? There, there's some rules of thumb. I gave you the example of Jesus being here. But uh, I, I'm going to tell you something. Outsiders are able to spot a difference right quick. You know? And, 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 and outsiders ask good questions. Liz asked uh, a question which was largely around to me. Uh, you know, what are y'all doing? I've had other people to ask. What kind of mission are y'all about? Is it just about worship or are y'all doing something beyond? And we are. We do our worldwide mission through the United Methodist Church. But then every so often I go to, the, to uh, Jeff and, and to the council and I'll say, the mission committee needs $5,000. I need you to give me $5,000. So they'll tell Joan, set aside $5,000. And then we'll enter into pain and suffering and we'll give that money where we do. And it's always good and always responsible. And then every so often, sometimes Tammy has to remind me, we'll, we'll connect with, uh, with Camp Church up there and we'll take up more money than we do food and we'll give it to them because they have a facility for it. We don't have a place for a food pantry or a clothing closet, but we can participate in those in other places and that's what we do there's a saying people may doubt what you say but they'll always believe in that which you do you know and we do it we do it in this place you've come to a good place we're real here and if we're real like we ought to be we become contagious in this place and as we become contagious here People are drawn to this place and to the moment, and they see what's legitimate in this pr place. Let's be that kind of people, okay? Diane comes up the steps this morning. She, we listened to Tim Reeves. When, uh, Sarah, Sarah did music for Tim in three little country churches before he went big time at Pine Valley in Wilmington. And Tim told this story, and I'm going to conclude with it because I like it. Tim said that, in this large downtown church that, that the place was about full uh, to capacity one Sunday morning. And all of a sudden they noticed somebody going down the side aisle over there and people couldn't help but notice him because he was so unkept, his clothes were so tattered, and those that he walked beside could smell him as well. So he goes down because he sees a place, one seat left on the front pew, and he's going to take that seat. Unfortunately for him, by the time 
He gets there, that seat has been taken, so he just sits down on the floor. Well, the people who are sitting there, who are part of that congregation, according to the story that Tim told today, he, he, uh, those people are wondering, well, surely somebody will go down there and ask him what in the world is he doing, and they'll help him to usher him out a side door or something. And they're just waiting for somebody to get on down there and to, to, to take care of the situation. Finally, they look up, and going down the side aisle is Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson's old like you, Bill. Are you awake? Are you listening to me? All right. Mr. Johnson has got a cane that he's walking with. He's headed to the front. Down the side aisle. And everybody's so content. Now, he'll, he'll take care of it. He'll, he'll, don't worry about a thing. He'll get it. According to the story, he finally gets down to where the man is. And he leans over to him. He says, will it be all right if I worship with you today? That's the church I want. The church that realizes the pain and suffering that goes on around our affluence. And that we enter into that in the ways that we can so that we might bring them to the water, so that we might bring them to the Spirit, so that we might make them one with Jesus Christ. All right? That's it. Let's sing. the wonderful thing about baptism the wonderful thing about accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior it's a great beginning 
it's the beginning of a life of service and worship in so many things. Um, I want you to continue to do what I asked you to do last week. I, I'm always inviting people to come and to be a part of the church. It's so very important to me. As we move forward, and, and, and not nearly as long as it has been, move back inside, uh, I ask you, please uh, connect with people who aren't among us and remind them that our COVID shots have been done and we can come back and worship. And if anybody tells you they don't intend to come back, you really need to let me know that, okay? But I'm hoping our people will return. Isn't it amazing how excited those disciples became after the resurrection of Jesus that 40, 50 days later, whenever he, he, he ascended into the heavens, they finally got it. Whenever they got it, that infilling of the Holy Spirit and that understanding of their role in the church as disciples of Jesus Christ, the world couldn't stop. The world can't stop you either. All you need to do is tell people about what Jesus is doing in your life. Not what he can do in their life, but what he is doing in your life. And then just let God take that and multiply it, okay? Go in peace. Amen. Amen.